is a member of the House Judiciary Committee, Congresswoman Mary Gay Scanlon. Congresswoman, thanks for joining us on this. Um, we appreciate it. So you just heard my conversation, I'm sure. Um, and I want to talk about some context here, as we, as we mentioned, right? Uh, City member of Congress at the time, Ralph Norman, calling for martial law, right? Three days before President Biden is to um, assume the office um, of the president. What, what do you make of that? I mean, it, it's obscene. And you talk about there being the possibility of unprecedented referrals for uh, prosecution of insurrection, et cetera. It's unprecedented that we're in a situation where the sitting president, sitting members of Congress are participating in that kind of an activity. And uh, martial law, by the way, not even spelling it correctly, that gives you some kind of insight into how conversant with the actual facts some of these folks were. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's interesting. Um, as I saw that, I, I recognized that it was not spelled um, correctly. But then I said, you know, I, I misspell things on text messages all the time, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna leave that one um, alone. What can be done about it, though? Well, I think we've already seen what should be done about it, which is a high-level national investigation. The hope was to have it be a bipartisan commission outside of Congress, but that was shot down by the president's allies. So we do have a bipartisan House committee that has dug into this issue, has followed every lead, has taken thousands of depositions, reviewed tens of thousands of um, text messages, um, all the evidence they could get their hands on. Of course, some of it's been denied them by the president's closest allies. Um, but they've done a high-level investigation. They've uncovered what happened, and they're going to present the nation with their final conclusions. But I think they've already done a really great job of pulling together the threads, because there was a lot that happened in plain view, in public view. Yeah. But putting it together so we understand why it was happening has been really important. So my follow-up here is, um, what recommendations do you want to see? What are you expecting to hear and to read um, in this final report? And what position do you see the Department of Justice in um, right about now? Um, because... They're damned, as I, as I talked to Joyce Vance in the last hour, damned if they do, um, damned if, if they don't when it comes to uh, criminal charges against a former president of the United States. Sure. Well, first and foremost, the purpose of the committee was to provide legislative recommendations, and I understand they're going to have a number of them, including reforms to the Electoral Count Act, which I'm hoping will push through before the end of the year. Um, Obviously, they have the ability to make referrals, criminal referrals, referrals for ethics violations, referrals for those lawyers who breach their professional responsibilities. Um, but what we've seen again, time and again, with this committee is they, they put together the evidence, they marshal the evidence, if you will, yeah. to see whether it fits within criminal categories or not. And we have some really, really brilliant and careful lawyers on that committee. I mean, Adam Schiff and uh, so Lofgren, um, you, they're not going to go out on a limb here. They're not going to refer criminal charges unless there's rock solid evidence for it. And it may help the Justice Department put together some pieces that maybe they haven't pursued in the same kind of way. Um, Congresswoman, while I have you, I, I, I do want to talk about um, the Judiciary Committee holding this hearing on um, combating uh, violence, uh, gun violence, I should say, this week. Um, let me just play some sound, um, some of the testimony that that your committee heard, and then we'll talk. Are we not tired of hearing the stories of victims, of hearing them from victims' families? Are we not tired of hearing yet another tragedy because of gun violence? When is enough enough? Some were missing limbs. Some had holes in their tiny chests. You might mistakenly imagine a funeral where a child lies peacefully in a colorful coffin. But make no mistake, there is no peace in the death of a child by a weapon of war. We just honored the victims of, of Sandy Hook. Um, I know um, those were a lot of family members of um, the victims at Uvalde. I spent a week down there um, after that mass shooting. Um, every day we lose people in this country to um, senseless gun violence. What real solutions um, does Congress have, especially going into this new Republican-led term? Well, you were showing there the sister of one of the victims of Uvalde. They played um, tapes from some of the 911 calls. It was gut-wrenching to sit through that hearing. That's Faith Mata. She was wonderful, so strong, speaking on behalf of her sister, who, of course, isn't here. 
We lose 30, we lost 3,600 children to guns last year. First time in our history that more children die from guns than any other cause, car accidents, mm. anything else. So we really have to do something. We're past the time when we should be doing something. Friday, uh, Thursday's hearing was about finding bipartisan solutions to gun violence. And it gives you an unfortunate preview of what we're going to be facing with the new Congress when the two witnesses called by the minority, one was someone who said that all of gun violence is the fault of um, children in fatherless homes. And the second one was basically yeah. the NRA's favorite statistician whose methodologies and conclusions have been debunked time after time for the last several decades. So it does not appear that we have serious interest in the other side in pursuing actual uh, solutions to gun violence. In, in my part of the hearing, I tried to highlight the fact that you know when Republicans say, well, we have to enforce the laws that are on the books, great. We have good laws respecting who should be able to buy a gun and under what circumstances it could be sold to them. We only have 2,600 employees in the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms. They can't inspect the gun shops the way they're supposed to. They can't stop the violations. And we know from a study that was done in Pennsylvania just this past year that 90% of the crime guns come from 50% of the shops. I mean, there are shops that are just violating the law wholesale. If we could just crack down on that, we could put a dent in this. Well, I mean, and you see the most recent mass shootings um, across this country, many of them had violations to red flag laws, right? Instances in which these shooters could have been stopped had there been um, had there been the institution of these, these red flag laws, um, and they weren't. They were not carried out, and subsequently people lost their lives uh, because of it.